And welcome to the February meeting of uh, Renew, formerly the Alternative Technology Association. Great to see so many people here tonight. Uh, my name's Alan Strickland. I'm the, uh, the Adelaide branch convener of uh, Renew. And the theme tonight is building a house, going through design, the build, and then performance, um, performance assessment and management. And to that end, we have three presenters. I have Catherine Hamilton, who is a member of the uh, Renew Committee and has been, along with John, been through the whole process of building a house with, and uh, um, assessing the, its performance. We have Paul Hendy, who is, let's make sure I don't call you an architect, is a designer of climate responsive homes of TS4 Living. And we have Ruth Nordstrom, who's the stu uh, studio manager at Suho, who will be looking at the, um, the performance uh, monitoring side. So we'll begin with a presentation from each of the panel. And at the end of that, questions, please don't uh, ask questions during the um, uh, the pr uh, presentations because we're going to have a long Q&A session which will probably go on until about nine o'clock. At our previous meeting I was uh, dragged over the coals for allowing it to go on to half nine so I think we'll uh, stop it about nine o'clock and then we'll have um, general uh, Q&A. So to begin talking about her experiences in buying a plot designing, building a house, opening it for two sustainable house days. Please welcome Catherine Hamilton. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming along. Um, we're really excited to have so many people here. This is me speaking as a member of the Renew Committee. Um, who am I? Um, I don't know. <laughs> a member of the Renew Committee, someone who was really interested in um, looking at energy efficiency and designing a sustainable house, but also looking at other aspects of sustainability, such as you know where you live uh, compared to where you work. So there were other factors uh, that sort of led to our decision. But we had this sort of dream and it, it got built on by a trip to Germany and uh, the UK in 2009. So all of what's happened that I'm talking about tonight has happened since then. Um, we decided that we were living way too far from where we were working uh, and uh, that, yeah, we wanted to start to look towards our ageing time, our time when we were looking towards retirement and some of you might be in that position as well. So, our first step was looking for land and so then you have to sort of have a bit of a decision about, well, do I buy an existing plot of land that's got a house on it and try and modify the house or do you try and find a piece of land where, you know, that's already been cleared, uh, that maybe someone subdivided from another allotment or something like that. Um, our dilemma was that we wanted to live fairly close to the city, so finding a piece of land that really hadn't been built on in the past was going to be a little bit of a bit of a tricky thing. But we did manage to find a 400 square metre allotment, which isn't very big when it comes to building a house and looking at setbacks that councils have in particular areas. Uh, so this was our um, this was the allotment. Um, we had a two-storey house there and on this wall over here on the other side was a single-storey house and they had subdivided what was going to be their tennis court. So we thought that was a pretty good deal. Let's put a house where a tennis court would have been and maybe that's a little bit, you know, uh, um, a little bit better use of uh, land close to the city for people to live in. But it was on a corner allotment, as you can see from the... Uh, little image there um, and it had so two frontages which uh, helped a little bit but it was flat it was 
fairly compact, but um, it had been used as a car park and it had been cleared and there was a lot of fill, so it did cause us quite a few issues as we went into the build process. But then what do you do? Well, then you have to talk to people. So you have to go through those whole, you know, deciding what it is that you want to build. And some of you may have some ideas already in your head about what it is that you want. And so my advice would be decide what you really want to have in your home, how many bedrooms you want, you know, what sort of size, whether you need a garden or whether you don't need much of a garden and on 400 square metres allotment you pro and two frontages, you're probably not going to have a huge backyard unless you go too high. Um, and I would just say start with everything and then, you know, maybe compromise along the way if you have to. If you really must compromise on something, then only do that after you've started with what you really want. Um, and then talk with a lot of people about your ideas. I actually got a group of students at University of South Australia because I didn't go back and tell you that I actually did my PhD from 2007 to 2011 in the urban planning discipline of UniSA and I had access to the building and construction staff, lecturing staff, including Professor George Zelanti um, at UniSA then who went on to head the architecture school at University of Adelaide before his recent retirement. And uh, I just, you know, started talking about this. I've got this allotment. What can I do with it? What, what should I do with it? What are the issues? How can I build a sustainable house on 400 square metres? And so we actually gave it to a set of students that were architecture students and uh, construction students as well. And they used it as a project site. And that was fantastic because you got all of these extra brains looking at your allotment and what could be done with it. And one of their briefs was it had to be sustainable. It, and it had to meet all of the requirements of the Development Act as well. So there were some interesting um, designs that came out of that. But you need to do your research as well on those aspects that you want, particularly when it comes to energy efficiency and what type of technology, etc., that you've got um, in, your, in your house. Um, having friends who are in the building trade uh, and people that you can trust, that you can talk to, is also very, very valuable when you're going into that building uh, phase. We had built with a volume builder in the past, um, and so, you know, we knew what it was like to go through the process of looking at a house being built on a, a piece of land that you'd purchased originally. So we'd gone through that, but we'd never actually then done the next step, which was to engage an architect and, and go on to build in that in that way. When we did go to the architect and eventually came up with a set of plans, this was what we saw on a piece of paper. So what you're going to see is sort of this two-dimensional drawing on a piece of paper. You do get elevations, which I'm not going to go through because there's no time to go through every detail. Um, but this was ended up being a two-storey house, but the upper storey was really a room in roof. Um, arrangement because we actually happened to be in a character area and they wanted us to build single storey. So we were restricted from a planning perspective on what we could actually build in our area. And yet the neighbours sort of looked more like a two storey house than a room in, than a room in roof for the second storey. Um, but we came up with quite an interesting design and we also had decided that we wanted rainwater. So we had to find somewhere to put the rainwater tanks and one of the things I asked the architect was, can I put them under the garage or under a driveway or, in, you know, somewhere? And he's going, hmm, you haven't got a lot of room. I really wouldn't recommend that you excavate to put them under your garage either. You don't really want them under the room. You want to be able to access them. And that's probably been pretty good advice along the way. But we only managed to fit two 5,000 litre uh, tanks in the ground at that stage. And they had to go in first before we started anything else. But we had issues. You can see North is there. The front of the house does not face north and we have this wall with our neighbours on that side. So the architect cut a piece of the roof out and created a wall of windows for us so that we have north coming straight in, so, um, which is a wonderful feature in our living area. Okay, 
that's the plans, then you have to try and do something with those. So you have to go through all of the approvals processes of getting it through your council. Uh, and so the architect started that process for us and had some discussions with them. And uh, then, um, uh, um, and it finally did get planning approval. The only things that were really considered, uh, considered that they needed extra was a landscaping plan for the garden areas and where the stormwater was going to go. So they wanted to see a stormwater design and some, uh, d some um, drainage lines and surveys uh, of contours, etc., for the block to make sure that we weren't going to... That make sure that all of the drainage water and the storm water was going to be able to go out to the street. Yeah. Uh, then we had to go, once we got all the planning approval, then we had to go through all of the building rules approval as well. Uh, and that entailed design, and these people here would know all about the design processes um, that engineers have to go through and make sure that everything then complies with the building code. Uh, so we had that done and we had all of the certification done by a private certifier and then lodged with council. Um, and so that was done sort of in two stages. So we got the planning approval first and then went through and then got all of the detailed design done. Uh, and of course then you need to um, talk to your banks about whether you can actually build this thing. So you've got all of these other approvals that you have to try and get at the time. We actually had some money uh, that we, were, we had uh, saved, which we were able to then to start the build, but we ended up having to go back to the bank and actually getting um, extra finance uh, to cover the cost of the build at the end. One of the interesting things that we did have was um, the valuation, because we were doing something which was we didn't really have an end end figure for in terms of cost, um, it became quite difficult for the bank to actually value what we were doing. So it's yeah maybe an interesting thing for you to consider is to talk to your bank early enough, uh, and and also ensure that you've got you know insurance that you can cover the build and. This is where we start getting on to the interesting part about being owner-builders because as an owner-builder, you have to take all of this risk on yourself as the builder rather than engage a builder to then take your approved plans that have gone through all the certification process and then give it over to a builder who then builds it for you and does all of these steps. So does all of the project management, which is all of this, and then does all of the site supervision and covers the building indemnity insurance. So as an owner builder, you have to do that yourself um, and then come up with project plans and select all your contractors and then schedule the whole thing and then build it. And this is quite a long list, but these are all the contractors you have to individually engage. And builders often have all of these people already, you know, lined up and have subcontracted uh, to, their, to their projects that they do. And one of these that we had to have was building certification because we had to get a sign-off that our house was suitable for occupation at the end. And that had to then be submitted to the council when it was uh, completed. So that's quite a long list and some of these were, you know, we had first fix and second fix plumbing together, but you can have those separately. So there's a lot of uh, work to do to actually get contractors together. So the process to select contractors, and Alan had asked me to talk about this in particular, was how do you find contractors? I mean, I find it very difficult sometimes just to get a plumber to come to the house, let alone get them to come and actually do first fix of a new house, which you know, no one's ever built before because it's not, it's not, uh, you know, some project builder. So that's really interesting. So we had to look at, you know, recommendations from other people, some other people in the building industry. We did, I did a lot of research online as well uh, to try and find um, uh, people um, and uh, reputable people. And how many quotes, you know, each time you go to a contractor, you know, they've got a lot of work to do to look at your plans and then do the quotes. Uh, so, in some we had one or two, and in others we had more. 
Um, and then the whole uh, thing about meeting them face to face to actually talk through what all of these, you know, what our building is about when you've got this sort of, you know, images on a piece of paper and then have to turn that into, um, you know, into some work that they can actually work with and, and other plans and us being novices in going through this, when I, mean, I took on that role, taking the architect's plans and then being able to, you know, talk intelligently about those plans to contractors who are used to working with people who are builders rather than owner builders. Um, and I, another thing was um, the examples of previous work. I think that's really important if you can get examples from, of previous work and we did that with our bricklayer because uh, we wanted to see what the quality of their work was rather than um, just uh, um, uh, go with, you know, what they said they could do. And then there's other things, you know, what is, what's the type of contract do you have? Do you have supply materials yourself and then they install it? Or do you want them to supply and install materials as well? So those are different types of contracts which you would need. And you need to have a contract with each of them. And these subcontractors or these contractors that you engage are supposed to have building indemnity insurance as well. That, in my experience, am I allowed to say this in South Australia? My experience, I don't know how many, there's not very many contractors which actually do have this building indemnity insurance. And that was our experience. Uh, but we managed to get it built. We managed to engage contractors to do each of it. It's reverse brick veneer. And so it looked very different. And some of the contractors didn't know, uh, had never dealt with reverse brick veneer, but were willing to work with us. And um, no, we managed, managed to work on a very compact site. So... The supply of materials was an issue. We managed to get a hoarding permit to use the footpath as well. So that was something that we had to do as well. And that's what it looks like. But it actually, the garden's much, much more developed than that now. But that was what it looked like at the end. So we managed to get it completed in 12 months, which I thought was a fairly decent effort. Um, and uh, we got certification, approval, all lodged with the council, and we were able to move in. 12 months after we started. And we also looked at, um, we have energy efficiency aspects within our house, which you can talk to me about later, or you can read about it in a book. That uh, There's a chapter on my house in a book that uh, we've edited and released on the Adelaide Sustainable Building Network's website. Um, we have PV panels on the roof as well. And, and the orientation of the house, which I'm sure Paul's going to talk about in his presentation, um, means that uh, no, we actually have two, pa two banks of PV panels, one facing northeast and one facing northwest, to give us 5.5 um, kilowatts of PV on the roof. Our key learnings through all of this as owner builders and as anyone trying to do this, I would say, be careful, <laughs> communicate, get as much information as you can from people beforehand in your planning, communicate during the, uh, the approvals process and communicate well with your contractors in your building process. You have to be highly organised and that's maybe something that I've got as a skill that I've had but I've applied to this and been able to get through it. You need to have one set of plans that everyone works from because you can't have people working from different plans otherwise you'll have things in the wrong place. Um, and we wanted a quality house so you re we really had to be working uh, very closely with each of the trades to ensure that the detail and quality was there because what one trade need, the next trade comes in, they've got to build on top of what people have done before them. And so you want that to be as accurate as possible. And that last point there, you actually need to, and likely need to educate contractors about energy efficiency aspects. You can't assume that they know about energy efficiency. You can't assume that they know what insulation is for and that they shouldn't be removing it when they're putting plumbing in the walls and things like that. Yeah. 
And if you want some more stories beyond mine, and there's a couple of people here who've got chapters. Can you put your hands up? We've got Bevan and Jenny. We've got Andrew. We've got um, another Andrew. And we've got David. And we've got Steve. There's a book that I edited and has been released. And Ken, who's here from ASBN, he's... Uh, uh, kindly agreed to m uh, make it available on the resource page of Adelaide Sustainable Building Network. Um, and there's about 12 house build projects. Some are renovations, some are new builds. Most are new builds um, across South Australia. Some, one or two in the country area, one at Blackwood, one at Murray Bridge, others in the metropolitan area. Um, and uh, the stories of the owner's perspectives of building, trying to build more sustainable houses. They go through their planning, they go through the building and they go through what it's like to live in the house and what they would do differently next time. So if you want to go through this process, do your reading and do your research. And also Sanctuary Magazine and Renew Magazine and also the Owner Builder Magazine have some um, great experience documented in that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Catherine. And of course, there's also Sustainable House Day on September the 16th this year, I think. Wait. No, you're not. I'm, I'm not dropping in for it, but it's, it's just a great um, opportunity to see how people have built houses, uh, what they've gone through, how they've gone about it, and their problems, what they'd have done differently, and how well the house performs, and you can experience it all. So thanks, Catherine. That's taking it from go to war. You may have already um, decided you want to have a sustainable house, but you haven't bought a block of land, or you may have bought a block of land, or you may have bought an existing house, and you want to renovate that for, um, for energy efficiency. Somewhere along the, the route, you need a designer. So to talk about how the designer, what the designer's role is, is how they interface with the client, what their ideal client would be, um, and a whole lot of other things uh, which only the, the designer will know from his, his or her perspective. Please welcome Paul. Good evening all, thank you for uh, inviting me. Um, I'll try to keep on time within 10 minutes if I can. I'm renowned for going over, so we'll go reasonably quickly. Um, passive consideration. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll look at a, sort of this rather globally, um, and I'll introduce myself at the end, which is why I speak with a funny accent. Um, passive considerations. Now, they're all pretty sort of obvious, really, probably to a lot of you here. And there's a very good resource, which I see over on the table. I actually brought my own copy here, which is uh, your, your home, which is actually a very, very good resource to look at. And that's where this particular diagram comes from. So when we're designing, ideally, we have a lot of north elevation to work with. But it doesn't always work that way. My own house is a very good example of that. It's facing entirely the wrong way, which was an interesting challenge. Um, if we've got a west elevation of fantastic views, we're down on Glenelg, we can do something about that. We have very high-tech glass now that we can use. We've got shadings that we can use that are automatic. We can automate homes. We can have windows that open and close automatically and lots of other features now, which we couldn't have a few years ago, relatively affordably. Um, good natural ventilation. Interesting, if you live on a hillside, it's great. If you live in the city, not necessarily that good. So we're starting to employ now, with our houses that we design and build, actually forced ventilation. So it's something which we can turn on and off as and when we need it, typically at night time. Okay, so uh, you'd normally get to, well, the coldest time for SA, or for certainly for Adelaide region, is around 7 o'clock in the morning. That's when we actually hit the coldest part of the 24-hour of the period. So you normally turn on sort of t typically about um, 8, 9, 10 o'clock, unless the temperature holds up. And then if you've got a bit of clever software, it goes, well, look, it's you know, 23 inside, it's 25 outside, keep the windows shut. So we're doing things like that as well to help uh, modernise homes. Passive heating and cooling. Now, Catherine touched on that, obviously. Uh, north elevation. Great. There's free sunshine here, something that I wasn't used to until I came here. Okay, we don't get that in the UK, we just get grey. So free sunshine, we employ that uh, wherever we can do to, to generate heat and warmth in our home. Shading. Again, look, like I said, if it's on a west elevation and that's where your view is, we can do all sorts of different shading for that. We, we're not stuck literally with large overhangs and eaves now. So my aim, I guess, uh, or the consultancy's aim, is to turn around and design houses that we can build in Norwood that basically 
look like they're ordinary houses. They don't have to have large hanging over or overhangs and eaves. Okay, it's nice if they do, but we can work around that if we don't need to. Insulation and ceiling, two things that Australian houses are not very good at doing. We actually employ some reasonably high-tech insulation from the UK, um, and that combined with products from here uh, create a typically sort of a very well-insulated wall that's approximately 220 millimetres thick. Um, typically, if I, for the technical at mind, it's about an R5, R5.2 wall. Um, ceiling, we seal our buildings. We actually do blow a door test at the end, and we have done that for many years, ever since the Zero Carbon House. And, uh, and that particular competition, and we, we blow a, um, did a blow a door test on that as well. Uh, I can bore you senseless about figures if you wish um, one day. So attention to detail. That's probably one of the most important things. That if you're building, and if you want to build on your own, you either do this yourself or you employ people and trades that understand. As Catherine touched on the subject, um, We've got a lot to learn here, okay? So it's not unusual for uh, a Sparky to go into a roof space. Actually, the refrigeration guys, I hope there's nobody here that does refridge, are actually really very good at doing this. They'll go into a roof space, they'll come at the last minute to fix everything, and they'll pull all the insulation out of the way. They'll put their pipes in, and they'll go home, which is great until the client moves in. So we go around and we thermally image our buildings as well, and we actually see where that's happened, and then we pull the refrigeration guy in by the ear and get him to put it right. Um, and that's not that unusual. Uh, that said, uh, again, as Catherine mentioned about uh, trades and finding the right people to do the right thing, we actually only use two builders, and we're slowly teaching them. It's great, and they're teaching their trades as well. So we're slowly sort of disseminating this information out to people. Uh, so their trades, they're gonna go to other sites, and hopefully in time, they may well influence other people within that site. It'll take a while, but you know, they, it'll, we'll get there slowly. Um, Cine insulation, about 25-30%, depending on what figures you want to look at. Um, if you're selling insulation, it's more. If you're not, it's less. Um, goes through the roof space. Now, if you put a decent bit of insulation there, you can actually reflect an awful lot of thermal energy back into the, the house. It's, again, not really rocket science. Cavity insulation, we've spoken about that. We don't actually employ um, double brick veneer, or sorry, um, reverse brick veneer. We actually, I'm, I tend to build lightweight. Um, and we found that you can actually overmass a house as well if you're not very careful. Um, and I think my own house is a good example of that. I'll get to that in a second. Oops. So, like I said, detailing of junctions. We seal our floor plates to the wall, to the uh, to the floor. It doesn't take that long. It's another 45, 50 minutes to go around a house, typically maybe an hour. But that's an hour's worth of extra labour, and somebody has to pay for that, and that's the client. Floors and ceilings, we do the same with ceilings as well. Continuous insulation, that takes me back to the refrigeration guy. Electrics also, by the way. Um, sparkies with, uh, with downlighters, wonderful things. Modern downlighters now you can put into a hole and put the insulation over the top, leave the driver outside, uh, and it works fine. And they'll, they'll last for yeah, as long as any other um, piece of equipment that's got good ventilation around. They're designed to be sealed in now. Draft proofing. Our windows, uh, aluminium windows, are probably about one of the worst things you can put in an opening. Um, you may as well put a piece of polythene in there and just sort of you know, tape it back. Uh, that's as good as our windows tend to be. We only use uh, German windows. Accessible mass, an interesting one. A number of places I've seen that have put in, and we very rarely install carpet in any of our houses, that put carpet on the floor. So you build, you design a lovely house, you, you go through, you go through, yeah, um, your home, you work all, all out the, the sort of the figures, you get a good star rating, and then you put some really thick Wilton carpet down. It's great. It's a very, very good insulator. The same with timber floor, to a lesser degree, depending on the quality of floor. Wants and needs. This is an interesting one here. Um, we have a number of people that come in and, and basically, you know, I have to ask questions like, do you really need six bedrooms? How many of you are there? Well, there's two. Okay. And then we start looking at flexible spaces and what we can do with those spaces. And quite often, we can bring a house size back by probably 30 to 50%. It's not unusual to be able to do that with a client. And in doing so, that has a sort of a tendency to half the build cost as well. A home cinema. We all want one. Either go to Hoyt's or combine one in your living space and hide it, which is what we also tend to do. 300 square meters of home. We actually build, not quite that, I exaggerated, um, 254, unless that figure's changed recently. 
um, I actually built four square meters bigger than America as our typical uh, square area. Build a smaller house. Correspondingly, it's cheaper to build, which reduces your mortgage, which gives you more spare cash. It's cheaper to heat, cheaper to cool, cheaper to decorate, easier to clean. I can't really see the negative side myself. Um, or do you want to be mortgage free? We have a number of clients now, and they range from 25 through to 80. Um, and it's surprising that the, uh, the younger clients that are coming in now, and I can tell they're younger because I keep getting text messages every five minutes, um, which is really difficult for me, but still. Mortgage free, people are saying, you know, we don't want to keep the mortgage. How can we design a house that has, uses less energy, that is smaller, that is more space efficient? And so we're actually finding that's one of quite, a, quite a big driver now. Carbon neutral. That's actually relatively easy if you design something carefully. Um, it's not something that many clients ask for, interestingly. Fewer ongoing bills. Well, we only do electric houses. Um, somebody's really got to twist my arm to put gas in there. So we will put gas in, but we'll put cylinders in. Because all our hot water, everything is generated, and we use basically the PV we install. Okay? We're not, uh, we don't install batteries as such, not as the norm yet. We actually uh, have held back from that until batteries become more viable. Because at the moment, the cost between a battery and its actual return on investment is just too high. Reduced dependency. Power cuts. I live in Beulah Park. Uh, we have a transformer down the road that blinks every uh, three months. It's been quite, quite good recently. It's really annoying. Um, no power for eight hours, you know. It's a bit of a drag. You're used to it so much. Um, things like that. We're having more and more people that want to design off-grid, and that's not necessarily 25, 50, 80 kilometers outside, in one case, 200 kilometers outside of Adelaide. Okay, quite often, there are people that actually are relatively close to the city. Difficult to do with water when it comes to wastewater, but with every other facet, I mean, it's relatively easy to do. The journey, that's me. You can hop on board if, with me if you want to, um, or not. Um, meet and discuss your ideas. Find somebody you like. Okay, um, I might seem reasonably relaxed, I tend to be, it's easy to get on with clients that way, but you know, we get clients come in and sometimes they obviously leave and never come back. It's rare, but they ha that happens. And there are, conversely, clients that come in and we look afterwards and go, no, we're not going to work with that client. So it's really important that you find somebody that you can work with. Okay, it's a long journey, typically for us around 15, 16 months from light bulb through to keys. Okay, because we do a, do a one-stop shop, basically. So, meet your client, your designer, or meet your, either way, you'll see that that goes you know, left and right. Um, very important. Oh, home cinema sneaks in. That's interesting. That's me. Um, being a creative, I tend to be slightly lax when it comes to th reading things like that as well. That's why I have somebody else do that for me. Um, wants, needs, and your budget. Right, be flexible with your ideas. You might not want the six bedrooms after all. It's quite interesting. If we sit down and talk you through things, you we can actually, you'll be surprised. Um, not twist your arm or convince you otherwise, because some clients say, you know, I do need the dining room I use once every year for Christmas. That's fine. But you're just going to pay more for your house, so long as you appreciate that. So there's always a dialogue with us. And now I think I've broken it. Oh. Um, prepare to be challenged. We will ask you those difficult questions. Okay? One of my favorites is, what do you do when you get up in the morning? You'll be surprised. I had one gentleman, he said, I always get a coffee. So I said, well, why is your bedroom 40 meters to get to your coffee machine? He didn't stay. It's OK. Um, be clear with your budget. OK? That's the, the first thing we ask. It may seem a, a sort of rather personal, but we ask you within probably about 15 minutes what your budget is. Because if you come in and you want your 300 square meter home, the first thing I'm thinking is, I wonder what your budget is. Okay, it's 185,000. Oh dear. So you can see the disconnect there. Okay, now we're very keen on trying to keep the budget. And nearly always at the end of a, um, and this is reflects on what you were saying, um, uh, Catherine, at the end of a project, we're within about 1.5 to 2% of our original starting budget. The actual build cost has gone up, typically because the client has had their eyes open. They suddenly realize that they can do so many more things that they didn't realize they could do in the first place. So. What happens is they keep adding, and we keep saying no, and it's a bit of a, bit of a tussle. Okay? Sometimes it would be quite depressing for me. Um, project costs. It is very, impossible, uh, very important, and again, Catherine touched on this. Professional fees. Um, I drive a 30-year-old car, and I'm quite proud of that, because its carbon has been written off years ago. 
Uh, it consumes petrol like it's going out of fashion, but I walk to work. There's the trade. Authority fees. It's actually rising quietly. Okay, so that can be several percent of a cost of the typical project for us now. Construction costs. Interesting. They're going up all the time. Our salaries might not be, but build materials are going up. And the other stuff. The other stuff's an interesting one because that covers everything from, I really do want my driveway. I'd love to be able to get to my garage without driving over mud. Yeah, how many houses have you seen on a large development where that hasn't happened? Gardens, landscaping, all the features you wanted, a clothesline that nobody thought about when they were designing the house. Where to put the wiggly bins? How do you get the wiggly bins out? Is there a side gate? There's numerous things I could go on about. All those things that are just not thought about typically when we design houses and the costs are associated with them as well. A closing slide. Um, I'm guessing most of you are probably familiar with Energy Star ratings. Yeah, zero to ten. Zero would be a tent. Yeah, ten would be a very low energy consuming home. Okay, which we'll hear about in a minute, maybe. Um, so what we what we have here are three little dots. Okay, the blue dot. That was my home when I first brought it. North facing veranda at the front, south facing garden. Okay, point nine of a star. Very cold in the winter. Very hot in the summer. Very uncomfortable, actually. For somebody coming from the Northern Hemisphere, um, incredibly, um, incredibly uncomfortable because we, you'll often hear somebody coming from where I do, from England or anywhere north, that Australia is the coldest place in the world to live, and it is. Okay? We have a period of time, three months, when unless you're, you're chucking heat at your house, you're freezing. Well, I certainly was in my house, anyway. Um, number four. Or the, light, the, the green dot that's on there, or it's a browny greeny colour. Um, that's the typical star rating for an Australian house. Okay, now yes, we should be six star, but we actually, when the CSIRO did a survey back in uh, December, I think it was, 15, turned around and said, oh, hang on a minute, we've done an as modelled and an as built. And the as built came out at about four star, three and a half to four star. Okay. And then the red dot at the bottom is my house now, that is around about 8.4 star. And that's pretty genuine because I meter it, I log data, I log external data compared to internal data, I have an automation system on there that turns fans on, that opens windows at certain times of the day, and does lots of other things. And I didn't put that in here because I didn't want to bore you any further. And that is basically it. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I must say, when I go back to the UK, um, especially in winter, visit friends and relatives, they always crank the, uh, the heating right up because they know you've come from this hot country and you must be freezing in the 10 degrees there. But um, anyhow, uh, when you've got your design done and the house is being built and when it's finally built, how do you know that it can perform as you would like it to? You can have a design assessment done, you can have a star rating done, you can have auditing done on the design and build, and you can have tests done when, when it's been uh, completed. And ongoing, you may want to put in a monitoring system so that you can see just how much energy you're using, where it's coming from, and get a, an idea of how, just overall, how well the house is performing. So to cover all that, please welcome Ruth. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so my role at um, Soho, pardon? My role at Soho is uh, functioning as the studio manager, but I work with a very close-knit team and we do uh, a lot of detailing that crosses uh, architecture, building design, science and the like. Um, and we, we very much regard design as something that um, can be beautiful because it engages with the emotion of the individuals that are in the house. Um, and I once heard, when I was actually doing my architecture degree, um, that a lot of the um, wannabe architects at that time were saying that you, we can't have an energy efficient building that looks beautiful as well, which I completely have worked against this whole time. Um, I, I believe that they go in hand in hand because otherwise if you create a house that's not beautiful, it's not comfortable, 
um, you know, it smells moist inside, you're not going to want to be in there and then you can't achieve that, that beauty that enriches your life. Um, so I think to myself and my team that I work with, that's um, quite an important driving factor for what we do. Um, we do a number of different assessment methods that goes across residential, um, architecture, building design, uh, optimization of renovations, commercial design, um, even into designing um, heating, ventilation and cooling uh, modules for larger buildings as well. Um, and hopefully going into something like what Paul has done with the um, multi-residential as well soon. Um, we also um, find there's a lot of benefit in a lot of the 3D modelling that we do because it's very data rich and some of these um, items like what Paul was saying about the costs, we can actually start putting them, we can actually start putting them into the, um, into the model themselves and have sort of a real time simulation of how um, these design changes that people are making are going to affect the overall cost um, and sustainability. Uh, so two of the questions that I was asked to um, address tonight uh, were to do with how we actually work with the architects and designers when they come to us. Um, so essentially that service is done in hindsight. We get people that come with a design already laid out. Um, we take that design, analyse the rooms, the wall construction, uh, floor, roof, um, and see if there's a way that we can actually optimise that space to make it more comfortable, um, and hence lowering the megajoule rates for heating and cooling. Um, if we have someone coming for a renovation, it's a little bit different because um, it's a little bit more challenging, but I actually quite enjoy that myself um, because you have an opportunity to retain some thermal mass in a lot of buildings, um, reuse them, uh, recycle materials, and really create a sense of um, a modern developing family lifestyle within that house. Um, funnily enough, Paul has kind of touched on this as well, so we're obviously on the same wavelength, but um, we find a lot, a lot of clients that come to us um, a little bit confused because there's a lot of sustainability washing through society. Um, you know, it's the most overused word currently, I think. Um, and you really need to get to understand what your needs are. So not necessarily the bedrooms, as um, Paul noted quite um, comically, um, but you need to work out what sort of activities, what habitual activities that you do in your everyday lifestyle. So if you are wanting to sit um, in your retirement in a, you know, a window reading a book, then those sorts of things you explain to your designer and your architect and we work out how we can make that space the optimal temperature and comfort for you. Um, and, and that goes hand in hand with ventilation and making sure that you're actually getting um, a, a very healthy building to actually reside in. So you're not ha having to go outside necessarily for fresh air. Um, the other thing that we find people are very confused about is um, whether they're designing spaces or systems. Um, it is possible to design both, so spaces refers to uh, just the general layout of your house. Systems involves uh, essentially designing the um, mechanical heating, ventilation, cooling, uh, automated windows, doors, shutters, blinds. Um, also looking at um, systems of the flooring. So like one of the houses we're doing at the moment has a hydronic heated floor. Um, looking at the materials that actually uh, on that floor so that they can also help facilitate the radiation of heat and retention in some cases in winter. Um, oh, the other uh, quite important thing that I uh, decided to put on this slide actually um, is a comment that I probably get about 50% of the time when clients come in. Um, they want to be sustainable but they don't know how to get there. Um, so that's one aspect of it, but they also don't realise that sustainability can actually be staged. You don't have to go out and set all of these massive goals and expect to achieve them because you're, you're wanting to achieve the impossible, essentially. Um, so especially with the renovation, it's a very good idea. If you go down a process of design, work out exactly what you want, and then you start um, putting in a priority for what you would like to implement first. So say that the first thing that might actually drop the energy bills down quite fast might be retrofitting windows uh, or doing the roof insulation, things like that. 
Uh, one of the other very important things that we do, um, which is uh, blower door testing, which Paul has also touched on. Um, we also look within the design process of um, what other monitoring systems that we can actually put in the house um, and test through the construction phase or post-completion phase that actually verify the data that we're essentially trying to create. So it's supporting the design. Um, so I, Catherine's also is it the same with her house. They're continually having that data going so they can actually see what their consumptions are. It's about educating yourselves about the way that you use houses. Um, I remember when I was a small child actually watching my parents um, continually operating a, a house that was very poorly, poorly insulated, um, pulling down the blinds on the outside, turning on the evaporative cooler and things like that. Um, I, I very much had it ingrained into me that that was the way a building worked, whereas that's not essentially a, a common thing that people do. They expect to walk in a building and the building can do it itself or they, they just switch the switch for the air conditioner. So it's very important to try to educate yourself and, and almost watch yourself in a third person. Um, some of the programs that we use have been mentioned. Um, we obviously do a, a element of consultancy. So um, a lot of people will come to us before they've even seen a site. They want to know what sort of orientation they might be looking for. Um, uh, as Paula said, not necessarily, you know, a north-facing site will give you all the best features. There, there are other ways to make a building work on, uh, you know, a, a north-south site by scaffolding the roofs and letting high-level light in as well. Um, some of the programs that we use, First Rate and Accurate and Design Builder, um, it's actually very good to get performance testing and design done earlier in the design phase because if we're concurrently working with these programs, at the same time that you're testing the shape and placement of your nodes, which are your, your rooms in the house, um, it can be very beneficial and then you're not wasting a whole heap of time in getting to the final building rules consent phase and needing your energy certificate. Um, so it's, it's very much um, a process that should be done from the word go. Um, but I, I tend to find down through this part here of the design process, there's a lot of things that involve uh, materials and other elements inside the house and systems design that will therefore fill that gap. Um, most of our performance design through first rate five is generally to do with um, a lot of the, the basics of passive design, shading options, uh, looking at the wall construction, adding in air layers, uh, whether they're ventilated or unventilated that actually um, create a steel cavity that is, is like having another thermal insulation layer in there. Um, so it's very good uh, practice to start getting some of these typical details uh, in your libraries as a designer so that when you have people coming and wanting like a reverse brick veneer wall we've got some standard details that we can work from that we've tested um, and then that can also help your design process as well. Um, the other thing which uh, funnily enough Jim my director noted the other day in a meeting um, some of the first rate ratings that actually happen, the back end of the program, which is all the, the coding and the, the nonsense that I don't understand, um, there's occupancy patterns that are actually put into these programs that are very old. Um, so even though you get a star rating, it might not actually take into account the way that you actually use the building yourself. So without producing a star certificate, we can actually look at the occupancy of your life essentially and try to program that into some of these simulations. So that would give us essentially a, a megajoule rate that we could work on and um, whether we reduce that further by optimising the house. Um, RoboRader was a um, bit of software that Jim and his IT team developed uh, and essentially when you're designing a house and it's got lots of different um, different locations that it could possibly have, roof colour, eave depth and so forth. The amount of um, times someone would actually have to sit at a computer 
to do all those simulations is quite a large number. You know, there's millions of different um, options that are out there. So there, are, there is software that's out there that can actually help your design if you've already gone through the process of being with an architect and we can actually start um, optimising the design and adding windows in certain places and things. Uh, this is an image of the blower door testing. So Paul mentioned this as well. Um, you're doing it on your all your buildings, you said? Yep, uh, as do we. So the little fan is essentially put into the door um, and taped up around the edge. Uh, and the objective of this is if you can get it done twice, so the first fix, um, actually, as, you, as Catherine mentioned in her presentation as well, um, you'll have some trades that come through in the first fix, like the electricians, plumbers. <laughs> They're notorious for just putting holes through anywhere. Um, so there's a couple of different strategies that you can use as a homeowner also to limit that. Um, when you go through and do the first blower door test, you make notice of where there's some leaks and things. Um, you can also mark on a site board where the penetrations have actually gone through the building fabric so that any other contractor that therefore comes on site can also see that they've got to actually adhere to um, what the stipulation is for sealing these penetrations. Um, and also, if you do that after completion, then you're also testing the finish phase. So obviously the outside here, this is all the stud work and the insulation. Um, if that's penetrated and then there's an air gap in front of it and then plasterboard, then you've got two sets of penetrations in the project, um, which makes for a very leaky building. And you can imagine if you can get inside of this wall afterwards to seal the problems, then that's fine, but most of us can't get through a plasterboard wall unless we've got a you know, tall ladder and go through the ceiling. So, is that moving? There we go. Uh, this this kind of lends itself to a little bit what Paul was saying as well. Um, these are the general areas um, of leakage in the house. Um, and your home, Gov, has got this diagram as well. Um, a lot of the ones that we look at when we're just doing the first rate five ratings would be like exhaust fans, uh, down lights, uh, what type of ceiling fans there are, if there's any penetrations. Um, gaps around doors and things like that are a little bit hard to model effectively. Um, as is the uh, hydronic heating in some of those pro projects. Uh, I was actually talking to Catherine about her place. She's got hydronic heating in the floor um, and she doesn't necessarily find that it's working to the, um, the expectation that she had. And she's also not aware if there's any um, slab edge insulation. So there's new, there's, there's supposed to be, yeah. And there's new regulations that say that you are meant to have the slab edge insulation as well. Um, so there's a, there's a few things that we can't test, but then are important as homeowners and uh, designers to actually specify and hold builders accountable for. Um, so this, just by example, is a detail. This is actually taken from the 10 star house. So the insulation here, just word of warning, is quite high to reach the 10 stars. <laughs> um, so I think the roof is an R8, if Geraldine's back up there, R8, yep. R8 in the ceiling, which is quite high. Um, and once again, we've achieved that by doing, uh, it's a smart joist system, which is um, a long webbed joist. And then we've got some blow-in insulation. We've got air gaps in between the two layers of insulation as well and an anticon blanket on top. Um, but the important part when we're doing this insulation that if we don't make this building airtight, um, then all of that work on the insulation is gonna be undone. So we have a layer of, um, it's, it's essentially structural plywood um, that runs along that face there and down here as well. So we're creating air gaps between the brick layers, the stud work and the insulation that might be ventilated or still, depending on what sort of moisture content we need. Um, and then we're also ventilating um, through the roof, through this service channel for uh, services as well. So that's, that's basically our airtight layer there that I've highlighted for you. Um, this channel just there is um, essentially something that we've dictated that services will go through. So normally, if you've got extra cabling in your house, and a lot of these monitoring systems may well have cables or Wi-Fi, um, there might be little pockets where you actually have to have uh, conduits and things going through the walls. So 
by actually adding this um, separate service layer, we're actually um, ensuring that they're actually not going to penetrate that. And they've got more than enough room in there. Um, this is just a sample of a typical monitoring system. I think in residential, sometimes people want to go um, a little bit too far with the monitoring. There are very, very simple systems out there that are only about $100. Um, you might, might need just an external weather station and um, a few sensors inside, but that should be enough to monitor your heating and cooling, which is probably the main objective of most people doing residential buildings. Um, you can get internal monitoring systems, which would sit inside this area here, um, which can potentially give you moisture rates. Um, but I think in Adelaide, that's probably not such a um, necessity. We're not exactly a, an environment that has a lot of moisture compared to Melbourne. Um, and also uh, the automation. So the 10 star house that we're building has actually got quite a lot of automation in it because we're actually testing the efficiency of, the e efficiency of these particular systems as well. Um, but your general eight star house, which is what we kind of recommend mo most people at least aim for, um, would probably find that this system is quite suffice in itself, just a small system. Uh, so once again, um, I was asked to uh, give you guys an idea of what sort of um, penetrations actually come through the slab, where to put the electrical con conduits and things like that. Uh, there are strategies that will allow you to, um, depending on how you insulate the wall, bring your conduits and your plumbing and everything from the streets through the wall itself. Um, in an instance like this, where you've got this outdoor area, um, and down this way is the street, we have actually had to bring um, a service riser into the centre of the building here, which all of the... Uh, HRV system all goes through the rest of the building. So HRV is basically a ventilation system that mechanically pushes the air through. Um, if you have a building that's too airtight, um, then it can be a little bit uncomfortable to be in, which is why this monitoring system also um, helps as well. Any penetrations that we find on a project like this, you can um, put in like a bit of spray foam, which is another thing that some owners have told me that they've done. Uh, or you can get, can get a special tape that goes around the outside, uh, especially in the case of windows and doors. Um, as a homeowner, although you're not technically meant to be on site, uh, you can actually go in and, and make sure that that's happening or, or get your architect to. Um, when you're looking at ventilation systems and performance in these sorts of buildings as well, it's quite important to also look at where the air is being expelled and where it's coming in. Um, if you're having a, a mechanical ventilation uh, house, you can actually bring air from the outside. Um, it can exhaust in certain areas, like the wet areas, and then bring fresh air into your bedrooms and living area. So this here and this one uh, are basically uh, fresh air that's coming in from the outside, and then they'll suck the stale air, essentially, from the other areas. And it just keeps recirculating the air through the house. Uh, there are other technologies that can also be used, um, like using the solar evacuator tubes on the roof, uh, coupled with the heat pumps for the water. Uh, we're still currently going through a bit of research in terms of what we think is the best option, um, and very much it seems a case-by-case -case scenario. Um, so to go back to those few points that I had up there before, I've, I've darkened off the other... Uh, initial questions, but um, just to reiterate that uh, establish not only the design brief for what you want your house to be, but how you want it to make you feel. Um, if, if you're anything like me and you're in a, a very closed off space with no windows, it becomes very uncomfortable. Um, as a designer or an architect, we need to also know that because we're all different. Um, we all have different priorities in terms of what we want to do. Uh, if, if we want to go Know, on retirement and you know, trip overseas like my parents keep doing, uh, then you need to have a house that can kind of maintain itself in the meantime. Uh, it goes with gardening as well. So, 
Um, look at the, your own consumptions of your own bills before you go into designing a house um, because quite often when a, when a client comes to us, they're wanting to know how to reduce their bills but they don't have a benchmark. Um, if you know that you're going to design a house in a year's time, start collecting the data beforehand. Um, start looking at your appliances and seeing if, if they're huge contributors, uh, like the hydronic heating um, that we're discussing before is quite a big drain on some energy systems. Um, so if we know that data to start off with, then we can therefore put like an equivalent number of solar panels to adjust for the energy use. So certain strategies that we can use. Um, once again, set a note how your people in your house operate it. So sit back and watch your kids and see if they'll actually open the windows. Um, I was actually talking to Paul about um, in my education studies, and I'm seeing the curriculum a lot, uh, there's a huge push for all of these youngsters to all know more about sustainability and essentially nag. So you'll, you'll have kids coming through your houses nagging you to open them and um, you know watch, watch them teach you essentially because they, they think they know it all. Um, and and just decide what your focus will be. If you want a systems design or a space design or you want a bit of both, you want to test out something for the first couple of years and then build on top of that later, we can do that. You know, it's, it's all achievable. Um, and just understand that there's different levels that we can implement over time. And that's it.